Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the PC Perspective Mailbag. This is a uh, show where we answer questions that you provide to us, either in the comments section to this YouTube video or in the comments section on PCPer.com where this video is posted. So if you have a question for us, uh, please do us a favor, leave it there. We filter through the questions, figure out which ones we can answer, and sort some out for Alan or Josh or whoever's going to be doing the mailbag that week. This week you get me a handful of questions to run through this week. Let's uh, jump right into it. First one is in from Adnan Ahmed. Asks, if NVIDIA's next-gen GPUs don't arrive until next year, would anything less than 7 nanometers be disappointing as AMD will be at 7 nanometers at that point? Um, two things. One, I, I don't think NVIDIA's next generation, next generation GPUs will slip to 2019. I think this is still a 2018 product. Uh, I know this question is probably based on the assertion or the statement that Jensen, CEO uh, at NVIDIA, said that it would be a very long, quote, a very long time before we would see the new generation of GPUs. That is a very... Uh, as a statement that can be interpreted in many ways. So that could be end of summer. That could be fall. It could be, you know, Christmas time. I think we'll see it before the end of the year for sure. I think we'll see them probably in l very late summer, maybe early fall time frame. Um, I mean, the truth is, is they don't really have a need to push this. If anything, they may have uh, a little bit more GPU stock than they expected to had, have, courtesy of the drop in cryptocurrency demand, right? So all the GPUs that have been ramping up and had been being sold into the cryptocurrency market are now kind of just sitting there. And I think NVIDIA, for its part, would like people to buy those GPUs as opposed to sitting on them and worrying about it. Uh, or people, they want people to buy those rather than waiting for some some cards to show up that may be three, four, five months out. Um so I, I think from a consumer standpoint, there is a legitimate argument of like, well, clearly we know they're happening. We might as well wait uh, for touring or whatever the architecture is going to be called. I understand that argument. However, if it were me and, and there's all this kind of pent up demand of now there's you know reasonable prices out there. I've been waiting. Now there's Ryzen 2000 series out. Maybe you know uh, Threadripper 2000 series will be out next month or whatever it is, July, August time frame. Um, yeah, maybe maybe instead of buying, investing in a 1080 Ti, I'd invest in like a 1070 or a 1060. In the meantime, if you were planning on that being an issue. Back to your original question, would if they were to wait until next year, but anything less than 7 nanometers be disappointing? Um, yeah, probably. But keep in mind, even though AMD said 7 nanometer GPUs in 2019, they didn't say when in 2019. 2019 is, as it turns out, still 12 months long. And they they could release it in February, or they could release it in November and still be inside, inside that window. So um, NVIDIA has a pretty good lead in terms of architectural efficiency, raw performance, you know, power consumption, all those things that go along with it. So I don't think... They're in a rush to get out there. Seven nanometer is going to be more expensive. It's going to be, you know, have a lot of uh, 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 inventory pressure from guys like Apple and Qualcomm and everybody else that's going to be trying to use it at the same time. So, from their point of view, it may make sense to hey, if we're going to go to, you know, uh, kind of this in between node, that that's fine, uh, and we'll and we'll see. So, no, I don't, I don't. I, first of all, I don't think we'll that'll happen in 2019, and even if it does, at the end of the day. Performance matters most, performance per dollar, performance per watt, and as long as NVIDIA's architecture allows them to maintain that lead, they should be okay. Dan McLeod asks, when will manufacturers finally start producing micro-ATX X470 boards? Lots of micro-ATX cases have been announced recently, and there's a lot of demand for this form factor on Reddit and other PC building forums. Any idea why nobody is making these? Uh, we don't have an answer for you there. It is... I think there was maybe one X370 motherboard that really launched. And uh, I would agree with you, especially considering when AMD was launching Ryzen, they talked up the idea of having these variable chipsets uh, that could could be supported there. Now, there are a couple of more options if you go into the B series as opposed to the X series. And you can still overclock on the B series like you can the X. So there's really, unlike in the Intel side of things, there's not a distinct disadvantage from getting away from the their Z series and going into the B B series parts, uh, B or H series parts. 
So for for AMD standpoint, you know, if there are B three seventy boards out there, uh, those would be worth considering. I don't know when they'll start producing micro ATX X four seventies. Um, it's just it's the, you say there's a lot of demand for this form factor on Reddit, but keeping in mind that that's a really small subset of the market in general. I don't none of these companies, especially the big three, ASUS, MSI, Gigabyte are uh, companies that I would expect to ignore the potential of selling product, right? Um, they're not not making micro ATX because they don't want to sell these products. They're not not making or they're not making them because they don't believe there's as big a market for that. So we'll keep pushing on them. We'll we'll do some more and and uh, we'll figure out. I'll if, if I hear anything, we'll we'll be sure to post about it. Beatwolf44 asks, do you think AMD will make a Threadripper APU for productivity workstations that don't require discrete graphics? No, I do not. A um, couple of reasons. Remember, Threadripper is a multi-die product. So it is uh, for, well, it, the current generation of Threadripper is two eight-core Zeppelin die, the same as the original Ryzen CPU. And Threadripper 2000 series will be three or four of those dies working in tandem. The APU is a completely different die, much larger, because it is a combination of CPU cores and uh, and GPU. Combining multiple of that, like, you know, we do want to do that because then you'd have GPUs across multiple dies, and then you have to worry about multi-GPU configurations essentially. And you wouldn't probably integrate one GPU or one piece of silicon with a GPU in it, and then two other pieces of silicon or three other pieces of silicon that don't have GPU in them. I don't know how that would scale well. It just doesn't seem like a market that I think is really necessary. That the number of people who want 16 cores or 32 cores from Threadripper that don't also want at least the semblance of power from a discrete GPU solution is going to be really, really, really low. Um, and if you're buying one of those expensive parts and you want to, you know, you don't really need the power of discrete, you can get a discrete GPU for what, 150 bucks. That's going to, you know, offer you a quite a bit of performance display connectivity. I think that's, that's the easier solution. I, I wouldn't expect any kind of uh, revolution there. Simon B asks, if I don't plan to buy an overclockable CPU, is it worth buying a Z370 motherboard to run my already purchased 3 gigahertz RAM on at full speed instead of 2666? Or does the H370 chipset make more sense? Overclocking is, a, is basically the reason you buy the Z series product. If you already bought the 3000, you know, the 3 gigahertz memory, uh, it would kind of feel like a waste not to run it at that speed. That being said, on the Intel platform, the frequency at which you run the memory doesn't affect general performance in the same way it does on the AMD side. It'll affect a small subset of apps, but also you know the benchmarks that show memory bandwidth. Uh, so the difference between 2666 and 3000 megahertz RAM is going to be pretty minimal, I think. Uh, I would look at it this way. You already spent the extra money on the RAM. Look at the Z370 boards you're kind of considering versus the H370 boards you're considering. If the delta in that price point, like if dropping back the H370 is going to save you 50 bucks, and that's what your premium was for that memory, then maybe that's a that's a good offset. If it's less than that, you know, spend a little bit extra, get the Z3 Z370 board, run your memory at the speed it's supposed to run at, feel better about the the products that you've purchased, uh, and then uh, run from there. That's kind of what I would do. Mr. Hamit, Mr. Hammett, I don't know, Hamit64 asks, how does UHD Blu-ray playback perform on a PC? Does it require less GPU horsepower than 4K gaming seems to? Uh, yes, absolutely 100% more. Well, not really. So uh, UHD Blu-ray playback is actually uh, accelerated by the CPU and the GPU to, to some degree, right? Um if you have a modern processor, you're not going to have any problems running UHD Blu-ray video locally or or through the optical drive itself on a PC. The the GPU horsepower necessary for rendering 4K is significantly higher, right? All else being equal, because it, 
basically you're rendering 3D workloads when you're gaming, right? It's creating the content as you go, whereas on a 4K video, it's just you know flat images that it's showing to you, right? So there's there's a there's a huge difference in the compute horsepower required to play 4K games and render 4K games than there is to play back simple 4K video. Now, if you have a three or four year old processor, you may find that playing back UHD 4K video is uh, uh, actually pretty tough on the, on the system. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind, but it's not really related to the computing requirements for, for 4K gaming really at all. Uh, this is an interesting question. It comes in from Lars SK who asks, why do Intel Itanium processors still exist? Last updated with the 9700 series last year. What are the what are they good at, or what were they used for? So that's an interesting question, uh, and I did a little bit of reading on this beforehand. The I, I mean, so the reason that they still exist is because there's still some servers, some older platforms that are that are using these uh, that are eight. They're almost all HP based servers because HP was the original partner, actually the original designer of this instruction set and uh, partnered with Intel to develop the products after they realized they didn't want to do all that research and development themselves. The, the, the short version of the history is that the idea behind IA64, which was the instruction set, was that it was called EPIC, Explicitly Parallel Instruction Computing. And the idea was that you could simplify the processor itself by removing all of the um, part of the architecture necessary for decoding instructions, reordering instructions, figuring out how to do the out-of-order processing the best, and instead push that completely onto the software side at the compiler. So the compiler would look at the instructions of the application, figure out which ones it could run in parallel, and basically parallelize compute um, CPU compute operations that way. It was an, it's a really interesting idea, and, and theoretically and, and uh, you know, academically, it's still really interesting to think about because it could have been, if it had worked, an interesting way to parallelize CPUs that we are still struggling with today, even though we have you know 16 and 32 core processors announced, parallelizing the software side is still uh, a pretty complex task. So they got into this. This was like you know 1994, 1995 when Intel partnered with with HP and they started building this. It wasn't until like 2001 we first saw these products come out. Long story short, it ended up being kind of a flop. Uh, it a lot of, I mean, like Linux, Windows, OpenVMS, Solaris, uh, all these architectures were built for it. They all built their operating systems for it, but the adoption was always very, was was very low. We had the Itanium, Itanium Two, Itanium Ninety Three Hundred, uh, Ninety Five Hundred, and then as you said, the Ninety Seven Hundred, which code name as uh, Kitson, came out literally in twenty seventeen. Um, with uh, eight core, sixteen threads, two point six gigahertz frequency, and thirty two megs of cache at its uh, at its at its premium. So the reason it still exists is because there are still some servers out there, mostly owned by HP. I think HP is ninety five percent of that market now. They have announced that um, that will be the last release of Itanium based products, IA sixty four based products. Uh, and an interesting kind of side note to that is AMD developed x eighty six sixty four at about the same time as a competing standard that was just basically plopped on top of x86, and that's what won, right? People, the simplicity of that is what won. It was the compiler, it was the software side that was really, really hard to get right. And um, the simplifying the, the chip idea made sense, but they could, nobody could ever really get the software on the compiler uh, to run with the efficiency that they had planned to get the scalability that they had planned for for it. So as for why they exist today, they don't. Technically, they've been they've been end of life, um, but there are just hey, there's some hardware here that we can then that has specific applications and software running on it. Let's keep it going for as long as we physically can, uh, and uh, that's like just basically a money saving venture at this this point. Next question, Southeastern777 asks, or says, or asks, some companies are selling water blocks for Optane drives. How hot do these drives get? The answer is not hot enough to need a water block. They do need heat sinks, and they need to have some airflow on them. Uh, I want to say, what was it, 25, 35 watts for like the 900P or the original Optane uh, data center drives. They're, don't get me wrong, they're... they're uh, uh, warm and power hungry drives for storage but they don't need 
they don't need water blocks. As for how hot do they get, I mean, that's that's a difficult question to ask. If you leave it without a heat sink, they probably would get hot enough that they would throttle. With with the heat sink, that we've never seen that as the case. And we do a lot of testing in open, open test beds. So if there was stagnant air that was going to envelope that card and, and cause some issues, we, we think we would have seen it. Although we do try to apply at least minimal airflow as if it weren't a case in those instances. Um, so no, I would say unless it's for cool factor and just wanting your whole system to be water cooled, I wouldn't look at water blocks for uh, Optane drives. Anonymous145-1345 asks, if the 8086K is just a binned 8700K, doesn't that mean that you'll now be more likely to receive a worse 8700K when buying that part, as Intel presumably just took the best 50,000 chips out of circulation? Probably yes. Probably that is correct. Um, if you take, if they legitimately took the best 50,000 8700Ks, then yeah, you're skewing the 8700K downwards in its silicon lottery, if you will. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything else to add to that. I, I mean, I don't think that's a good enough reason to spend the extra money on the 8086K versus the 8700K. Uh, I mean, if you look at the overclocking we've done and the overclocking that people way more experienced with OCing have have done, you're getting about the same, right? With from the 8086K to 8700K. So I don't know if the 8700K was kind of already straining the silicon as far as it could go with water cooling or even the LN2 water uh, LN2 cooling that um, somebody like Derbauer has done on these parts. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. I, Intel has definitely confused things a little bit with the 8086K versus the 8700K. Uh, but to me, the 8086K, you should only be buying that if you you know, understand. You get the joke, you get the anniversary, and you kind of just want that part because of its cool name or whatever have you. Um, yeah. Last question in from Sean. Most motherboards and cases still come with USB 2.0 ports and headers, in addition to the USB 3.0 ports. I heard that USB 3 had some teething issues early on in terms of backward compatibility. That's true. Have those problems still not been solved, or is there some reason or some other reason for continuing to include dedicated USB 2.0 ports? Um, yeah, so when you're building a case, you have no idea what they're going to put in it. You have no idea if they're going to put uh, an old motherboard in it or a new motherboard. And so there's there, that's part of it, right? Uh, the other thing is, is cost. It's just those USB 2 headers are cheaper. And so if you want to just have more USB ports on there, you can, uh, you can include that. I would say there were some teething issues with backwards compatibility in USB 3. Like uh, uh, you couldn't get into the BIOS if you were attached to a USB 3 port with your keyboard versus USB 2 port. Some of that stuff may still exist on older motherboards that haven't updated BIOSes or, or what have you. So I think it just kind of makes sense. Um, there, are, there are cases coming out now that only have USB 3 that you know, I think for, for, for our standpoint, people who are watching this type of content, uh, it makes more sense. If you're buying a new case, chances are you're going to put a new platform in it. You're not just going to move your existing platform over. And if that's what you're doing, then you have USB 3.0 headers on there. That also, that also could be another issue. Some motherboards may only have one USB 3.0 header on it, and in which case... If you want more than two USB ports on the front of your chassis, then they include these other ones as well because you may your motherboard may have one or two additional USB 2.0 headers. So it might be just a reaction to the uh, the motherboard ecosystem as well. So that's going to be it for us for this week. Again, if you have questions, leave them in the comments of this video. Leave them in the comments at PCPro.com. And if you want to uh, show your support for the PC Perspective site and the content we produce, go to PCPro.com, check out all the articles and stories there, or go to Patreon and or go to Patreon.com slash PCPro. And uh, you can become a patron for a dollar a month, three, five, ten, twenty, fifty dollars a month, whatever you want to do. And that's what led to the creation of the PC per mailbag. Uh, so we greatly appreciate that. And who knows? Maybe next week we'll have some questions to answer about that that monitor back there that Ken's on. It's a G-Sync HDR monitor. More to come soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.